On the phone, Jill Stein, candidate for the presidency of the United States uh, from the Green Party. Uh, welcome to the program, Jill. Thanks so much. Great to be with you, Sam. So, Jill, uh, let's start. Um, uh, I, I know one of the sort of the central planks of what you're, reading, uh, you're running on is known as the Green New Deal. Tell us about what, what that is. Yeah, well, you know, we've got this uh, emergency going on, uh, more than one of them, in fact. So one part of that is a jobs emergency. We've got high and sustained unemployment and underemployment, and we have another emergency, which is the climate, which is melting down far faster than the science predicted, and it's been uh, shown to be, you know, far too optimistic. Um so we got two problems, and the good news is that we can solve them both in one fell swoop. This is uh, what we call a Green New Deal. It's based on the New Deal that actually got us out of the Great Depression in the 1930s. We can create jobs directly now, jobs in our communities that make us sustainable, both ecologically as well as economically and socially. So the Green New Deal would provide national funding for communities to decide what kinds of jobs they need. And this includes the spectrum of jobs that we traditionally think of as the green economy, that is in clean renewable energy and conservation, in local organic agriculture, public transportation and clean manufacturing. And we can also create the jobs that we need to be sustainable socially. Let's hire back those hundreds of thousands of teachers that have been laid off. Also, daycare, after school, home care, violence and drug abuse prevention and rehabilitation, as well as affordable housing construction. We have the resources. We have the people who need the work. Let's put them back to work. And one thing I should add is that it creates, the Green New Deal creates a whole spectrum of types of work. So it would create public services, and public works, where instead of going down to the unemployment office, you go down to the employment office and you get a job that makes your community healthier, stronger, more just, and sustainable. But it also provides startup money, grants and loans for small businesses and worker cooperatives to um, get up and running and create that transition to a green economy that is also a local economy. This doesn't, you know, provide the big bucks to multinational corporations. And unfortunately, you know, that, that's what the president's stimulus package did in 2009. It was a majority uh, of money that went to tax breaks for large corporations. That doesn't create jobs. Instead, this creates jobs at the community level by jump-starting those small businesses and worker cooperatives we need to recreate those local economies, and they also recirculate the dollars locally instead of shipping off profits to corporate headquarters in the Cayman Islands. It's a win-win for our, our economy, for jobs, for the environment, and just to add, it also has the benefit of making wars for oil obsolete. All right. Well, let me – so, uh, I mean, I, I... – I mean, I, I'm not sure the the characterization of the of of the the, the stimulus is um, if I agree necessarily with your your characterization of the stimulus, but um, uh, because I mean, I think well, well, that that's a fact, and you know, I mean, you can talk, we can debate whether the stimulus was effective or not, and you know, statistics suggest it created about two to three million jobs. That was good, but it obviously didn't fix the problem. Right. But the, you know, the real problem with the stimulus was that the majority of the funding was actually corporate tax breaks. Tax breaks are an extremely expensive way to create jobs. We're arguing that the money needs to be put directly into job creation, not tax breaks. Right. All right. Well, I mean, I listen, I agree with you. Uh, tax breaks are an incredibly inefficient w uh, means of stimulus. I... I as far as I know, the 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 tax break, and not just for corporate, but also for uh, personal taxes, 
um, was more along the lines of about 240 billion of the 770 billion, uh, maybe maybe 300 billion. But um, but I certainly will uh, would agree that. Uh, to the extent that the the stimulus bill had stimulative effects, it was it was not large enough, and uh, exactly. uh, and and I don't know that it it created any long term structural changes in our economy, which is clearly also you know uh, uh, the point. Um, yeah. So going beyond um, uh, of this, and I and, and I want to speak in, in a bit in terms of uh, of sort of sort of the larger. Structural challenges to governing from a third party, uh, but sure. what other mm-hmm. what what other what other issues do you think are, are on the forefront of of your campaign? Well, you know, I'd say on the forefront of our campaign, and really the forefront of the American people who are also clamoring for real health care reform that provides. Healthcare as a human right, which is supported in poll after poll, that we need a public option or or a Medicare for all solution, which is what we're calling for. That is healthcare for everyone, covered comprehensively, that puts you back in charge of your healthcare decisions, not a profiteering CEO, and which also saves us trillions of dollars over the course of the next decade because Medicare for All puts an end to the massive, wasteful health insurance bureaucracy, and it stabilizes medical inflation. So it's a win-win all around, Um, and the public is with us on that. I think we're also with the public in calling for uh, downsizing the military and bringing our troops home uh, from uh, you know, from uh, Iraq, from Afghanistan, in especially large numbers, and as well as from these over a thousand bases in over 140 countries around the world, the public supports bringing the troops home and actually downsizing the military. And we're calling for a return to the military budget before this incredible buildup over the last 10 years as we've extended drone wars, for example, deeper into Pakistan, into Yemen and Somalia, and sending armed troops now where they've never been before in Central Africa, uh, building new bases in Southeast Asia. You know, I think the American public does not support this massive, bloated military-industrial security complex, which is costing us about a trillion dollars a year. We're calling for the budget of about 10 or 12 years ago, which was about half that size and would return hundreds of billions of dollars a year to um, to our needs here at home. I think the public is also with us in calling for taxes on the rich. And this is not just, you know, a slap on the wrist of, uh, say, the millionaire's tax, which was a step in the right direction but doesn't get to the real waste, fraud, and abuse in our tax system. We need to actually put a transaction tax on Wall Street that would generate uh, hundreds of billions of dollars a year at the same time that it reigns in this incredible um, gambling and speculation on Wall Street, which is a, a, a good in and of itself to rein that in. Uh, we're calling for taxing capital gains like income so that billionaires are not paying at half the rate of their secretaries and, and janitors. The public support taxing the rich and the. I, I gotta say, I just saw I just saw a statistic. I think it was um, I'm not sure in, in the context of what, but that 50 percent of all income that is subject to the to the to capital gains tax goes to point point one percent of the population. Point one percent of the population mm-hmm. gets 50 percent of the mm-hmm. income from capital gains. That is just stunning. That is just a stunning uh, uh, statistic. It absolutely is. And, you know, it makes capital gains actually a, a much more uh, high-priority target, actually, than even the income tax because because the profits are outrageous and they are targeted to the very tippy, tippy top of the extremely obscenely rich. So, yeah, absolutely. These are the kinds of um, changes we're calling for that the public is actually clamoring for. And I'd add to that um, uh, legalizing marijuana because it's a drug which is dangerous 
because it is illegal. It's not illegal because it's dangerous, because, in fact, it's not dangerous. It's certainly far less dangerous than alcohol and uh, tobacco, which are completely legal. It needs to be regulated. It needs to be taxed. It needs to be put out of reach to young people on the street who have essentially unfettered access right now to the illegal uh, and criminal distribution system, which is basically, you know, uh, running almost scot-free. And the war on drugs needs to be converted to a, a public health arena, not a criminal arena. And legalizing marijuana is the first place to begin with because our jails have basically doubled in size over the last 15 years. The prison system is the second fastest growing expense of our state government, but it's largely locking up, you know, people of color who are uh, imprisoned for uh, mostly nonviolent offenses for possession and recreational use of uh, marijuana. So this is completely um, unjust and uh, needs to be uh, fixed and can be fixed at the same time that it not only saves us an enormous amount of money being wasted on this bloated prison industrial complex, but it actually earns us money by putting marijuana into a legal and uh, taxed framework. Uh, let me ask you about uh, what was at least the predicate for the for the stimulus in 2000. Nine, which was the the housing crash and the tremendous amount of wealth that was lost when that uh, housing bubble burst. What, 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 how would you approach the, uh, the, the this problem and also the, I guess the the problem uh, that we've encountered in terms of the the rampant mortgage fraud that took place in those uh, those build up years and in in many respects it continues. Absolutely, and thanks for bringing that up. I should have mentioned this as another key issue uh, in our campaign because we are calling for an immediate moratorium on home foreclosures and calling for a, a policy that requires the banks to negotiate with homeowners to keep them in their homes. That's why we bailed them out. That's also why Congress provides hundreds of billions of dollars to the president and the White House, which unfortunately they refused to use, and they allowed millions of homeowners uh, to be thrown out of their homes, some six to eight million who've already been thrown out, and about that many more are in the pipeline, and essentially nothing has been done. So we would require uh, the banks to negotiate, and as part of that negotiation would call for lowering the principal on these mortgages down to current market value, because that's what happens when banks evict homeowners anyhow. Um, they wind up uh, then selling the home if they're able, or the home you know, simply languishes unoccupied and vacant, which is a real danger to communities, brings down property values and becomes a, uh, you know, a, a, um, uh, a platform for, for crime and drug abuse and so on in the neighborhoods. Uh, but let's Let's lower those values now and keep those families in their homes. Look, the banks, you know, talk about moral hazard here, you know, which has been used as an excuse by the banks. The, the real moral hazard here is, is with the banks, in fact, and with the mortgage brokers, because they not only settled predatory mortgages targeted elderly, people of color and the poor, uh, and and peddled and pushed these loans on people under very false uh, pretenses with false advertising, pushed people into these loans, and then they actually bundled those loans into fraudulent securities, pushed those securities on their clients, then bet against those securities uh, in uh, in derivatives, and then asked to be bailed out. This is absolutely outrageous. The banks are bigger than ever. They continue to commit fraud. Uh, Almost on a daily basis, we're hearing about the latest Wall Street scandal, including this latest LIBOR scandal, the London uh, inner bank offering rate, supposedly. It's a credit rate, which turns out to uh, be allegedly manipulated, and banks have already been fined for that in Europe, and the investigation has just begun into the U.S. banks. But you know, this 
goes on. Yet you have the Obama White House declaring that Goldman Sachs will be held basically uh, unaccountable. They can get off scot-free. They will not be brought to trial, even though Congress filed a special report suggesting that there was rampant waste, fraud, and abuse going on at Goldman Sachs. The White House has refused to hold any major executive accountable. So, in short, you know, there are two solutions. One is that we actually need to bring the uh, the authors of this crisis and those who committed waste, fraud, and abuse, we need to bring them to trial. They should not be too big to uh, fail or too big to jail. We need to break up the banks, and we need to start by putting an immediate moratorium on foreclosures and requiring banks to uh, negotiate to keep homeowners in their homes. That's why we bailed them out. Okay, and uh, Jill, um, uh, uh, I mean, it all sounds... Um I mean, I think that's the. Uh, I I couldn't agree more, frankly, uh, <laughs> with uh, with your analysis and uh, the the prescription. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, uh, just a uh, uh, ballot access and uh, matching funds. I just want to get a sense of of where you're at and where uh, people have the opportunity to vote for you. I'm looking at your uh, a map on uh, JillStein.org uh, and. It appears like you have ballot access in at least almost 40 states at this point. That's right. Um, there are some where we're currently filing the, the last petitions, states that had late deadlines. But we're, we're currently firmly on the ballot in something like 34, in the process in another six, and uh, possibly getting on the ballot in another three, four, or five states. And the exciting thing is that we are firmly on the ballot in the large states, in the states that are really the population centers, everything from Florida to New Jersey, New York, Illinois, Ohio, uh, California, Texas, you name it. If it's a big state, we're already on. So that we will be offering voters uh, somewhere between 90 to 95 percent of voters can be sure that when they walk into the voting booth on November 6th, they will have a real choice that is not already bought and paid for uh, by Wall Street, and that you will not have to simply choose between two candidates that, when you vote for them, it essentially gives uh, Wall Street a mandate for four more years of this raking us over the coals. There will be a way to stand up and say, uh, we've had enough, and to build a vehicle for real opposition and for taking back our democracy and implementing the policies that the American people are already clamoring for. 